want to do in the next one and a half hour. First, a very brief introduction of who we are and who is Data Lives for International and who am I. Then we discuss the goals of the training. When we talk about process capability, we talk about variation. So I'm going to explain how variation is calculated in the process capability indices. Then I'm going to explain the calculation of the capability indices, how are these indices calculated. Um, we can calculate the variation in different ways. So I'm going to explain what is within subgroup variation versus total variation. Then we have to discuss process capability when we talk about processes in control and processes out of control. And then I would like to give you some ideas about the practical use of capability indices. Calculations is one thing, but how do we use these capability indices in the practical day-to-day -day business in our companies? And then I will open the recording. Uh, un I will unmute everybody, and we can have questions and discussions. Okay, Datalyzer International. We started in 1979 in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and we are 20 or almost 30 years in business developing software for statistical process control, measurement system analysis, OEE, and FMEA. And we are also uh, involved in the implementation of these techniques. We have more than 3,000 customers worldwide. My name is Mark Scheffers. I'm the CEO of Datalyzer and myself. Uh, actually, next Friday, I'm 25 years with the company, so I have 25 years experience with the implementation of these techniques and the software development and implementation of these techniques. So I should be able to answer some of the questions you have. What is the goal of the training today? We're going to explain the calculation of the process capability indices. How are they calculated and how do, how do you uh, use them? The uh, differences, there is a lot of confusion between CP, CPK, and PPK. There is a lot of discussions going out there uh, around what, what, what they are, what they're used for, how they are calculated, and there's also a lot of mistakes going on. So I'm going to explain what the differences are and what the, uh, the origin of some of the confusion is. Then we would like to offer you knowledge how these process capability engines can be used in a practical way. What is the, the advantage in the day-to-day -day business? So that's the goal of the training. At the end, you should understand the, this, these goals should be achieved. When we talk about process capability, we are going to compare uh, allowed tolerance, what the customer is asking from us, with the process variation we have. And how do we uh, look at the process variation? Most of the time, for process capabilities, we use the normal distribution. And the normal distribution, people already have seen this more often, is if we take measurements and we, we draw a, a distribution curve through these measurements, we will get this normal distribution curve or the Gauss curve. We have 250 measurements here, so you see in a practical implementation that you don't always have an exact fit. You are missing some points here and there. There are some points more. This is typically how a normal distribution looks in practice. The average is indicated with X double bar, and the S indicates the standard deviation, and that's sometimes also called the sigma. If we take the picture slightly differently, we can show the average, which is in the middle, we show the one sigma zone that is between the average and one time the standard deviation. Yellow is the two sigma zone and purple is the three sigma zone. We know a lot of, about normal distributions. So what we can say is that 68% of the measurement is between average and one sigma. 95% is between average and two sigma. And 99.7% is between average and three sigma. So what we use in the capability index when we talk about process variation, we use six times the standard deviation. That is how we define the process variation. And be aware that sometimes there is a slight chance, 0.3%, that there are measurements outside that variation. But that's what is used in the capability calculation. Now, how do we do the calculations of the capability? The CP is the capability index. How is this calculated? What we do is we take the allowed tolerance, what, which is allowed from the customer. So in this case, the USL is 40. The LSL is 20, could be anything, grams, millimeters, doesn't matter. It's just 40 and 20. So the allowed tolerance is USL minus LSL is 20 in this case. And we divide the allowed tolerance by six sigma. And six sigma in this example is 10. So the CP value in this example is the allowed tolerance, is the blue line divided by the red line. In this case, it's 40 minus 20 divided by 10. So the CP value of this process is two. In other words, we have two times more allowed variation than the variation we are using in our process. That's what we define with this capability index. If we look at this capability index, we can do the calculations in the same way. So we take USL minus LSL divided by six sigma. 
the blue one divided by the red one, that's 40 minus 20 divided by 6 sigma is 10. The calculations are exactly the same. So 40 minus 20 divided by 10 is 2 again. So the capability of this process is also 2. So it's exactly the same as in the previous process. The only thing we look at, at the, when we look at the capability is the allowed tolerance divided by the process variation. We don't take into account whether the process is properly centered. So we can have a CP value of 2 and still produce 50% scrap. So what we need is we need to take into account whether the process is properly centered or not. So for that reason, this is a summary of what I just said, and for that reason we need uh, the index is called the CPK index. That is the CP index which takes to in, into account whether the process is properly centered. So what do we do? We look at one side of the uh, distribution. We look from the process average to the lower specification limit and divide it by three sigma. And we look from the upper specification limit to the process average and divide it by three sigma. And that is the minimum of the two is the CPK index. Let's look at an example. Here we see an example of a process. We see the process average, the overall average of the process. We see two times three standard deviation. We see the allowed tolerance from the process average to the upper specification and the allowed tolerance from the average to the lower specification. If we look at the calculations, then CPK is the minimum of the process average to the lower specification limit. And that these are the calculations I just showed. Now, how does this look in the graph? The lower side is the process average to the lower specification limit. That's green divided by red. That's the average minus LSL divided by 3 sigma. In this case, the average is 35. The LSL is 20. So we can do the calculations. The green bar, the green arrow divided by the red arrow is in this case 35 minus 20 divided by 3 sigma is 5. So we only look at half the total variation because we only look to the variation from the process average to the specification limit. So this, the, the lower index is 3. And this is sometimes also called the CPL. So the CP, the capability on the lower side. In the same way, we can do the calculation for the upper side. We take USL minus X bar divided by 3 sigma. That's blue divided by red. In this case, 40 minus 35 is 5 divided by 5 is 1. So the process capability of 1 indicates that the 3 sigma border is exactly touching the specification limit. And the CPK is the minimum of these two. So the CPK value equals 1. Yeah? So the CPK certainly takes into account whether the process is centered or not, whether, and the CP didn't do that. Now let's look at another example. We see that the CP value of this process is 1, or in other cases, the total variation divided by the process variation, they are equal, but the process is off-center, so we can calculate the CPK value, and the CPK value, the, mo the most critical specification limit is the upper specification limit, so we take USL minus X bar divided by 3 sigma, is the blue divided by the red one, in this case, it's 40, the upper specification minus the process average divided by 3 sigma is 0 0.5. So the CPK value is 0 0.5 and the CP value is 1. So the CPK value, if, it, if we are off-center, is always lower than the CP value. Here we have an example which is slight, looks slightly more difficult, but, but let's simply do the calculations again. We take the minimum of the two, in this case the USL is the most critical limit, so we take the upper calculation. And USL minus X bar is zero, because they are exactly the same. So USL minus X bar is 40 minus 40 is zero. So what we basically have is we have zero divided by five, so the CPK value in this case is zero. So we know if we have a CPK value of zero, that, that we have 50% out of specification and the CP value is 2, so the variation is perfect, the location is not good. So from the combination of CPK and CP, we know variation is acceptable, location is not okay. If the location would be exactly in the middle, the CPK value would be 2, and then CP would be CPK and would be 2, as is the case in this example. In this example, we see it doesn't matter whether we look at the upper specification or the lower specification to find the critical one, 
because x bar is exactly in the middle. Now, in this example, I used the upper one. So it's 40 minus 30 divided by 10 is 1. And that's equal to the CP value. So if the process is exactly on target, CPK equals CP value. Now, we, we used in the calculations, we divided by six times the standard deviation. But how do we calculate the standard deviation in, to calculate the capability engine? Now, there are two methods which are used in practice. The first method is that we use the standard deviation is calculated based on all the individual measurements. So we look at one week or one month of data. We take all the individual measurements, not looking at subgroups or something. We put them all together in a histogram and we calculate the individual the standard deviation. That is the real standard deviation of all the measurements we ta we've taken in, the, in that time period. That's method one. The second method is that we, what we are going to use is we are going to use a control chart. So we are going to subgroup the data. We put the data in subgroups. And what we are going to take is we are going to take the variation within the subgroups. And we are going to store that in a range chart or in a standard deviation chart, depending on the subgroup size. But mostly we use a range chart. So what we have is we have an indication of the within subgroup variation, which is the average range. So the green line in this example is the average range of the of the within subgroup variation, and that's an indication of the standard deviation of the process. So what we basically do is we say we use this estimated, this average range, and we divide that by a factor D2. And D2 is simply coming from a statistical table. And D2 is, of course, depending on the subgroup size. If you have a huge amount of measurements, that factor will be six. If you have less measurements, that factor will be smaller. So we don't calculate the standard deviation based on individual measurements. We estimate the standard deviation by taking the average variation within the subgroup and divided by a fixed factor. And because we estimate it, we use the sigma sign with the circumflex with the hat on top of it. Another name for estimated standard deviation is called sigma hat. So first method, total variation. Second method, within subgroup variation. The nice thing is, if we have a stable process, and these two met methods will be approximately the same. There will not be much difference. Let me show you in an example how that looks like. What we can do is we can run a simulation. What I've got here is I've got a process launcher firing tennis balls. And we see that these balls bounce and they come at a certain distance. So 395 is the distance. And I can fire more balls. We can use in this process, we can define the, the type of distribution, and we can define that this process should be producing with a normal distribution with no disturbances. And what we can do is we can simply run a large number of measurements. So we've got 352 measurements. We know that this was a stable process, and we can look at the data. So we can show the histogram, and we, shank, we can show the capability indicate, indices. Here we also see the standard deviation, and we see the estimated standard deviation. And you see that they are approximately the same. As long as the process is stable and has no disturbances, there will be very small difference between the standard deviation and the estimated standard deviation. And the more values I take, the closer these two values will come together. So what we've done, as an example in the training, we have made seven production runs where we took 25 subgroups of five measurements and we calculated the real standard deviation and the estimated standard deviation. And you see in seven production runs that there is hardly any difference. The maximum difference we find is 2.5% difference in standard deviation. So we can say that if the process is stable and we don't have special causes of variation, that the estimated standard deviation and the real standard deviation are the same. No difference in calculation. Okay, before I'm going to explain the difference between CPK uh, and PPK, if it's not a stable process, I first have to explain you a little bit about the confusion and what is the confusion which is ar going around in the market about CPK and PPK. In 1995, when QS9000, the Inter International Automotive Standard started, something changed. Before 1995, we used the CP and the CPK index in a histogram, and we used the calculation based on real standard deviation. When we showed a control chart, we used the estimated standard deviation. So we used the same definitions, the C 
CP and CPK index were used in both graphs, but one was based on the real standard deviation and the other one was based on the estimated standard deviation. That time, there was also something called the PP and the PPK, which was used as a preliminary capability index. That was indicating the capability for the first production run. But the calculations were done in the same way with the real standard deviation for the histogram and the estimated standard deviation for the control chart. And that was very confusing for everybody. We, we had to do a lot of explanation explaining what, what was used and how this was used. So in 1995, QS9000 started. Now this is called the TS16949 ISO norm. And they introduced new definitions. What they said is the CP and CPK are calculated based on estimated standard deviation. Doesn't matter whether you show it in a histogram or in a control chart. Always CP and CPK are calculated based on the estimated standard deviation, that's the within subgroup variation. PP and PPK are calculated based on the real standard deviation and are called the process performance indices. And that's always the total variation you find over the total period. So the formulas basically are the same, only with CP we use the estimated one and with PP we use the real standard deviation. Similar for CPK and PPK. So when we have a stable process, CP and PP will be the same. And this is also the other way around. If we have CP and PP the same, we, are, we know we have a stable process. Because if you have an unstable process, CP and PP will not be the same. To give you a little bit more confusion, some people mention CP and CPK are the short-term capability. That's even more confusing. They, they mention that because it's based on estimated standard deviation, and they say that's consecutive measurements, so that's short-term. And PP and PPK are long-term. This is so confusing, we certainly recommend not to use this, because you can also have a CP and CPK over a long-term period. I can perfectly report a CP and CPK value over one year of data. So these definitions go around as well, and at the moment on the internet and everywhere, and it's extremely confusing. So we strongly recommend not to use it in this definition, which is described here. Okay, that's a little bit about the history. Now, if we use the new definitions of the TS69 for 9, how will that look like if we have unstable processes? Now, what we see typically see when we have unstable processes and we have processes out of control, in a process we have common cause variation. That is the normal variation we have that can be slight differences in materials, slight differences in temperatures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can have two types of special causal variation. The first one is that the process average is not at exactly the same location. So the process has shifted. It can be any cause, but the process is not exactly on target anymore. The second special causal variation is that something has broken and the, the values are completely uh, out of order. We can have measurement mistakes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, to identify these special causes of variation, we normally use the control chart. So the first special cause of variation we see on the average chart, that is the, if the process average is not on target anymore, the special special cause of variation we see on the range chart or on the sigma chart. Now let's, let's take a look what happens with the CP, CPK value and the PPK value if we have an unstable process. Here I show you an example of a process with five production runs. And these production runs are within the production run, they are fairly stable. Not much going on. So what we've shown here is a control chart and control limits per production run. But we see that there is a big difference between production runs. And this can be anything. This can be a new batch of material. This could be an injection molding machine running on different machines. This could be multiple cavities, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of situations in practice where we see that we don't have stable process average. If we are going to show this information of these five production runs in the histogram, how will the histogram look like? So what we do is this is the histogram for the first production run. This is the histogram of the second production run. So you see within the run, we are pretty stable and it's looking like a normal distribution. If we combine these two production runs, the distribution will look like this. It's not so nicely normally distributed anymore. We can add the third production run. We see that the pr third production run is fairly outside specification. More than 50% is outside spec. We can add that, and it's even looking less as a normal distribution. 
But if we add enough production runs, if we look at the long term and we add enough production runs, and differences in variation are fairly stable and fairly uh, uh, normally distributed as well, then here we have the data of all the five production runs. And we see that if the variation is pretty normally distributed of the averages, that the total variation is also normally distributed. Now, what we see here is we've added two bell-shaped curves, two normal distributions. The green one is the total variation. So that's six times the standard deviation for all the five production runs in total. And we see that the standard deviation is 112. The black curve is the estimated standard deviation. So this is the variation we have within the subgroups. That's obviously much smaller because the variation within the subgroup is much smaller than the total variation over the multiple uh, production runs. So the estimated standard deviation is 58. The total standard deviation is 112. That means that the CPK for this process is 0 0.73, and the PPK value of this process is 0 0.38. So CPK is much higher than PPK. And so we know from these two indices that the process is not stable and that we have special causes of variation. Now, how does this affect the information on the long term? What we can also look at, we can look at the CPK and the PPK value of the individual production runs. So production one was running with a CPK of 0, uh, 0 0.69 and a PPK of 0 0.66, etc., etc. You see for all the five production runs that the CPK and PPK value are almost equal. But we also see that there is a large difference between production runs, and production run three even had a CPK and PPK value which was negative, which we already saw in the histogram because we have more than 50% out of spec. If we look at the overall CPK and PPK of all the five production runs, we see that the PPK is 0 0.38. And if we compare the, S, the, the expected number of defects based on a PPK value of 0 0.38, that's pretty close with the number of defects we saw in this example. In this, real, in this example, the real defect percentage, so the, the individual numbers out of spec, was 12.8%. And based on the PPK value, we would expect 12.7%. So you see that if you have a lot of production runs and the production is not stable, but the total information and the total measurements are fairly nicely uh, normally distributed, that the PPK value gives you a pretty good idea of what the defect percentage is. What is the theory? What is the practice? Here you see some examples, just as an extra information, there are a lot of situations where we don't have stable production uh, systems. That could be grinding processes where processes are slowly drifting, parallel processes, machines, cavities, spindles, positions, lanes, etc. material setup differences, etc., etc. Even the Six Sigma, uh, methodology, which is used a lot, indicates that processes are never stable and they drift 1.5 sigma on average. I think that's a very dangerous statement that depends a lot on the type of process, but it gives you an idea that there is a common uh, indicator in industry that you don't have stable processes. So how do we handle it? We hear a lot that the theory says if the process is not in control, if you have special causes of variation, you are not allowed to calculate the process capability index. Now, the question is, if they are never, never stable and you always have some out of controls, even with a perfect process, you have 0.3% out of control. So what do we mean by not in control? So in practice, this is not really always realistic. What we, basic, what we better can use in practice is that if the range of standard deviation charts, so the variation chart on the control chart, when they are okay and they are pretty much in control, and pretty much in control we mean less than 4% out of control, and the total capability histogram shows the normally distributed data, then the PPK, the overall PPK, gives a very good indication of the quality level of a process in the long term. So if the data looks pretty nice and we have got a PPK value of more than one, we are fairly certain that over the long term, that we will have not much defects. If there is a big difference between CPK and PPK, you have to be very careful to make a prediction for the first next production run, because the first next production run can be really bad. The first next 25 production runs will show a fairly predictable result. So this is how you can use this in practice 
yeah, ideally, the difference between CPK and PPK should be as, as small as possible because that indicates that you have a stable process. Let's take a look on how we can use capability in this in a more practical way. Now, the requirement of the capability in most industries is that it needs to be more than 1.67. That means we have some safety margin between the borders of the process and the specification limits. Now, I've got three processes here as an example. The first process has a CP value of 1.7, a CPK value of 1.7, and a PPK value of 0 0.8. Second process, CP 1.7, CPK 0 0.8, PPK 0 0.8, and the third process has all three capability integers equal to 0 0.8. Now, with these capability integers, I can immediately say what is the problem, how can we fix it, what is easy to fix, and who is responsible for fixing this. So the question is, which process is easiest to improve? Where can we get the PPK value the quickest to 1.7? And who in our organization is responsible for fixing this problem? Let's take a look at the graphs. So a CP value of 1.7 indicates that the process variation at 9 o'clock when we take the first measurement is pretty small compared to the allowed tolerance. We have 1.7 times more allowed tolerance than the variation we have at a certain moment. CP equals CPK means that the process is on target over the reported time period. CPK is not equal to PPK means the process is not stable because the within variation is much smaller than the overall variation. And that indicates that the process is slightly drifting over the day. Could be this kind of example, could be also multiple shifts. The second process, CP is not equal to CPK. That indicates that the process is not on target. If the process would be exactly in the middle, then these two would be the same. But it's on one side of the, of the tolerance, and it could be on this side, it could also be, have been on the other side, but in this example, we've, we've drawn it on the lower side. CPK equals PPK, that means that the process is stable. We don't have differences in process average. The third one, CP is 0 0.8, that means if we take a number of measurements at 9 o'clock, we will already find so much variation that we will go outside specification limits. CPK equals CP, means we are on target, and P CPK equals PPK, it means we have a stable process. Which process is easiest to solve? There, is always, there are always exceptions, but on average you can say that this process is easiest to solve. We simply have to adjust the process to the target, and then the, CP, the PPK will be 1.7. This process is the most difficult to solve. We are not even capable of running two consecutive products within specs. So that, this requires a redesign of our process, different material, improvements in the process, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we can increase the capability by running the process much slower, but these are exceptions. In most cases, it really requires a redesign. Also, responsible for making this change is production. So in this example, production simply needs to adjust the process. Responsible for this change is engineering because we have to redesign the process to make the products, the consecutive products capable. This one is slightly more complicated. This could be a production problem because people are changing or the process is slowly drifting away, which they are not adjusting, but this could also be an engineering problem. It could be tool wear or, or warm up of the machine, which is not under control, et cetera, et cetera. But the nice thing is if, I've, if you give me the CP CPK and PPK value of a critical characteristic in your process, I can immediately tell you what the problem is and which department is responsible for fixing this problem. One more thing, which is very important about capability. It's very important that we get a better feeling on how is our capability index influenced by the number of measurements. Because if we take three measurements, we can already calculate the capability index, but how reliable is that statement? So what we have shown here, if Let's assume that we get a PPK value of 1.67. And what is the confidence, the 95% confidence interval of the PPK of 1.67 if we only take 10 measurements? So if the total measurements were, which we use to calculate the PPK is 10 measurements, then the 95% confidence interval of the PPK value will be between 0 0.91 and 2.42.
that means 1.67 is not really saying you something. You can still have a PPK less than 1 or even a PPK of 2.42. With 25 measurements, the confidence interval will be 1.20, 2.14. measurements, it still will be a lot of variation, 1.34, 1.99. 100 measurements, the variation is slightly lower. It's 1.44 and 1.90. So the curve looks like this. In the beginning, with a small number of measurements, you will have a huge amount of variation. If we have 1.67, it could be 1.83 times more or 0.69 times less than the original capability index. That's why in automotive requirement, for example, the minimum number of measurements is 100. They say if you take measurements which are 50, the amount of variation in your estimate is already too big. You have to have more measurements, 100 measurements, then you have about 13, 14% variation in your capability index, which is acceptable. And you see that it's only slowly improving. You have to have a really, really large number of measurements if you want to have a, a very, very predictable capability index. Okay, how can we use that in a practical way? A very nice way about reporting about capability is that we make a capability overview of the whole company. We might have hundreds and hundreds. Some of our customers have more than 100,000 characteristics. So if they want to report about quality, they want to report about the capability of the company. And the way we can do that is that we say, okay, how many charts do we have for a specific process area or a specific line? We have 12 charts. We are going to report about the capability if the charts have more than 100 measurements. Otherwise, we're not even going to report about the capability because it's not reliable enough. So in this example report, seven charts out of more than 100 measurements. How many control charts were in control? That means we don't have special causes of variation or we have less than 4% special causes of variation. And we see that three charts have so many special causes of variation that it's not reliable enough to, to uh, report about capability. And for the charts who have enough measurements are in control, we can make a prediction about the capability. And then we distinguish between capability less than one, between one and 1 and 1.66, which is almost acceptable, and bigger than 1.66 are capabilities which are really acceptable. Now, if you want to show this table in a more graphical format, then we can do it like this. So in this example, in January, we had 34 charts which had a capability of bigger than 1.67, which is in control, enough measurements, and a capability bigger than 1.67. 23 characteristics were almost okay. They had enough measurements in control. Capability was bigger than one, but still not enough safety margin. 98 characteristics were not okay, whether not enough control, not enough measurements or capability less than one. And everybody in an organization understands that if we get more green, that we are really improving and that we are that we're making improvements in the quality and the productivity of the of the process.